Good afternoon, everybody. Your exams are right here behind this podium. I carried them down on the subway, the number one by myself. So I hope you get them. I don't want to carry them all back again, OK? They'll be up um, on that level after lecture. The distribution of grades are posted on the coursework. There's a, there's a graph for the two separate courses, 3310 and 4310. The percentage is posted. Okay, because that's how in the end we will grade you. So you, people in general did better than last time. <clears throat> As always, if you have any questions or comments, just uh, ask me. Now today uh, is another really cool topic. We're going to talk about transformation, mostly a little bit about oncogenesis. So let's start with an experiment. You take, a, in this case, a hamster embryo could be a chicken or a mouse embryo. They're typically used to make cell cultures. You chop it up, you digest it with trypsin, so you get single cells, and then you put them in a culture dish, a plastic culture dish. The cells, mostly fibroblasts, will attach to the plastic and make a nice monolayer. You can see down here on the left the individual cells, and eventually they will grow in to fill the monolayer, and then you will remove them with trypsin, and dilute them and put them on a new plate and they'll grow out again and you can keep doing that for 30, 40, maybe 50 passages and then they die. Okay, the ends of the chromosomes get short, they're mortal, they will die. Sometimes a rare colony will arise like this one that's called transformed. It has very different growth properties which we will talk about momentarily. You can make cells transformed by treating them with mutagenic chemicals, by irradiating them. You could infect them with a virus. They will become tra transformed, and they will grow forever. They will become immortal. And that's what we're going to talk about today, transformation, how viruses do it, and how this is one step on the way to cancer. Transformation and cancer are not the same thing. So transformed cells is something we study in the laboratory. It all came, all we know about this comes from studies in the lab, using cells like I just showed you, these normal cells, and making them transformed. They're immortal. The first immortal human cell line was HeLa cell line, taken from a woman in 1951 from her tumor of her cervix. And these were the first to grow forever and ever. They have very interesting and different properties, these transformed cells, okay? And these are really important because we're gonna try and explain today how these arise. They don't, they don't need a surface to attach. So most cells, if you suspend them in agar on a plate, they will not grow in the agar. They like to have something uh, to attach to. Transformed cells do not need an anchor. They, are, they have lost contact inhibition. These normal cells on the left here, when they touch each other, they stop growing. The transformed cells keep growing. They pile up on one another. They make foci. That's one of the properties of transformation. Colony formation in semi-solid media, I've already told you about that. They will, they will grow in agar. They have grease, decreased requirements for growth factors. So typically you put serum on cells to provide growth factors, and these have uh, fewer requirements than non-transformed cells. And as I said, you can make these with a virus infection. And today I want to tell you how that works at a molecular level. Now, that's transformation. The next step is oncogenesis, which is the development of cancer, of course, which is a tumor, a malignant tumor, a growth that doesn't stay put, goes into other tissues, and eventually will kill you. It replaces normal cells. Cancer is a genetic disease. It's caused by mutations in our genome. And these mutations, and they usually you need about 7 to 11 mutations to make a cell turn into a cancer. These affect cell communication, growth, and proliferation. And these in mutations, of course, can be inherited. You can have a predisposition in your family to cancer. They can be caused by DNA damage that arises spontaneously. Or carcinogens in the environment. Many uh, examples on record were where chemicals cause tumors, infectious agents, including viruses. There are some human cancers that are caused by viruses. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But I want you to understand that transformation is not the same 
as oncogenesis. They are two distinct things. Transformation happens first, and then maybe the transformed cells will turn into a tumor. So transformation we talk about in cell culture. That's how we study it, by looking at different cells in culture. Oncogenesis, the development of a tumor, requires an animal, of course, and it requires additional genetic changes. Today we're going to talk about how one genetic change can lead to transformation in cells. But for those cells to become a tumor, they need more, as I said, 7 to 11, roughly. But we study virus transform cells to provide insight into the events that give you transformation, which then has oncogenic potential. Okay? We didn't understand any of this before we started studying virus-induced transformation. And what you're going to see today is an incredible story of how we have worked out the entire mitogenic control system of the cell, all because of viruses that mess with it. It's really incredible. So even though viruses cause cancer, they don't do the whole thing. They put the cells on the road to cancer, all right? They transform the cells, and then when cells, one of the properties of transformed cells is that they keep dividing. They never stop. And when that happens, you accumulate mutations, and eventually you hit the 7 to 11 mutations in the right, cell, in the right gene, and you become a cancer. All right, so these are some viruses that cause cancer in various uh, animals and humans. There are RNA viruses. Hepatitis C virus cause, causes liver cancer. A lot of hep C infections globally. Lots of liver cancer. Uh, retroviruses cause a variety of cancers. We talked about HIV being associated with cancers. HTLVs are also uh, associated with cancers. And then there are DNA viruses. Uh, adenos, hepadenoviruses, hepatitis B viruses. Again, another cause, big cause of liver cancer. There's something like 350 million people chronically infected with Hep B uh, globally, and many of those will go on to develop liver cancer. Herpes viruses, um, papillomas, of course, human papillomaviruses associated with cervical uh, carcinoma, uh, polyomaviruses like uh, SV40, and some pox viruses. So we're not going to talk about most of these today. We're going to talk about retroviruses and some of the little and medium-sized DNA viruses to, to develop a story to show how viruses transform cells. Now in people, uh, about 20% of our cancers, human cancers, are attributable to virus infections. And these are the human cancer-causing viruses. You should recognize pretty much all of them. Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, HTLV1 and HIV1, the two retroviruses we talked a little bit about last time, human papillomaviruses, uh, human herpes virus 8, and Merkel cell polyomavirus. This is the most recent uh, human tumor virus identified. These are major causes of liver, hep B and C, many millions of people having liver cancer caused by those viruses. We're not going to talk about them today. They, their etiology, the way they cause cancer, is very different, so that's a different lecture. But in cervical cancers as well, the human papillomaviruses. And now we have a vaccine against this, so this shouldn't happen anymore, but of course not everyone receives the vaccine. One thing, if you only remember one thing today, I hope you do remember more, but one thing, malignancy is not needed for any virus to replicate. It is an accident. It's a side effect, and we're going to explore today how it's an accident. Okay, no virus needs to cause a tumor to replicate. In fact, no virus needs to transform cells either. That's an accident too. Viruses uh, have other things to do but not transform and cause cancer. All right, so depending when you downloaded the PDF, this slide might or might not be present. I'm sorry I accidentally deleted it last night, but it's an important one. And this is the beginning of the story we're going to tell today. October 1st, 1909, Peyton Rouse got a tumor from a hand shown here. This is a solid tumor, a sarcoma, and he ground it up and he filtered the extract through a small filter to remove everything and let the viruses go through. And he injected it in a chicken and the chicken developed the same kind of tumor. First time a solid tumor was shown to be caused by a virus infection. So Rouse worked at the Rockefeller Medical Institute at the time uh, and that's where he did this work. It took 50 years for the world to accept this, that a virus could cause tumors. Part of it was that no one cared about chicken tumors, 
uh, and there were other reasons, mostly because people didn't understand how it worked. But he eventually got the Nobel Prize in 1966. This is the longest incubation period ever for a Nobel Prize. The discovery made in 1909, and over 50 years later, he gets the Nobel Prize. So he isolated a virus called Rouse, sarcoma virus. He named it after himself and after the disease that it causes. And there are two more Nobel Prizes that we're going to talk about today that stemmed from work on this virus. So that's pretty good. Three Nobel Prizes in all. All right. Now, there is a wonderful book. If you want to read an amazing story of our understanding of cancer, this is The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee is an oncologist working at uh, the Medical Center at Columbia University. He won a Pulitzer Prize for this book, which he wrote while he was a resident. Okay? It is an amazing book. Just beautifully written, and it goes through the whole story. Anybody read it? You like it? Yeah, I like it a lot. It's great. So you guys, if you need a distraction, you know, it's nice out, take this book and go outside. You will not regret it. It is beautiful. So I'm going to give you some quotes from this, because I love it. I mean, I used to teach this lecture without Siddhartha, and now he's put me to shame, so I'm going to just quote from him. So this is a good summary. By the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps. The virologists, led by Rouse, claimed that viruses cause cancer, although no such virus had been found in human studies. And that was one of the problems. No one cared about the chicken cancer. It wasn't a human virus. The epidemiologists argued that exogenous chemicals caused cancer, although they could not offer a mechanistic explanation. He tells the great story of chimney sweeps in England who were young boys so they could fit in the chimney, and they would wear shorts, they would get scrotal cancer. And he turns out that it's the tars in the uh, lining of the chimney that did this. So this is a great story that he tells. But they couldn't figure out how it worked. And the third camp possessed weak circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer, the genes inside of us. And that of, all of these are right, in fact. And the retroviruses pulled them all together amazingly. Now, this story resumes in the 50s with Howard Temin. We have talked about Howard Temin before uh, working here at Caltech. He went to Caltech uh, to be a postdoc with Renato Dulbeco. Now, remember, Renato Dulbeco developed a plaque assay for poliovirus. This guy was in the right place at the right time. 1950s, cell culture had just been developed, and he said, I'm going to take this cell culture thing and use it for virology. He developed a plaque assay, and then he started using it to study transformation of cells. Incredible. He got a, he got a Nobel Prize at the same time that Temin did. So Temin went to work on fruit flies, but he didn't like them, so he switched to Rouse sarcoma virus in Dobeco's laboratory. And here's, here's the key. Until the late 50s, Rouse had been shown to cause tumors only in chickens. You know, people kept inoculating chickens and you would get tumors, but you can't figure out mechanisms by doing that sort of thing. So he wanted to do it in cells in a Petri dish. And in 1958, he took seven years, he figured it out. And what he did is he took the cell cultures that Dobeco was growing in his laboratory. Dobeco had the foresight to think, these cell cultures are going to be valuable for figuring out what's going on. So Temin took Rouse virus from a chicken, put it in a chicken, grows up in the tumor, make a filtrate, and he put it on cells growing in culture. And this is, this is, these are um, Mukherjee's words. He added Rouse sarcoma virus to a layer of normal cells in a petri dish. The infection of the cells incited them to grow uncontrollably, forcing them to form tiny dis disoriented, distorted heaps containing hundreds of cells that Temin called foci. The foci temin reasons represented cancer distilled into its essential elemental form, cells growing uncontrollably, unstoppably, pathological mitosis. Right, now, these, are, these are not tumor cells, okay? He was a little bit off. These are transformed cells, but he was on the right track. He was figuring out the first step that the virus did on the way to a tumor, which was to make the cells transform. And there are some pictures here of transformed cells. So these are bird cells transformed by Rouse. Here's the monolayer of normal cells in the background. They're well behaved. And here are some spindly looking transformed cells. So these are infected with Rouse. It changes their properties. And here are some, they can also be round uh, as well. So the virus is transforming the cells. This was an incredible observation. Now, let's, we're going to come back to this. 
But first, I want to talk a little bit about the DNA viruses, because at the same time, Dolbeko is letting Temin play with an RNA virus. He's got DNA viruses in his lab, and he's figuring that out. 1962, polyoma virus was found to cause uh, transformation of baby hamster kidney cells. Very rare. 1964, uh, after infection of mouse cells with SV40, rare cells grew out as colonies. So two examples of transformation of cells by DNA viruses, not the Rouse sarcoma virus. And, it, and the key here is that they're rare. Most of the cells die, so you infect the cells with these viruses. Most of them die, it's a lytic infection, but there are always a few left that are transformed. And those cells uh, have the properties that we've talked about, they're transformed. So the, key be the question became, how does a virus do this? Because we know that for a virus to uh, transform a cell, you have to reduce or eliminate cytopathic effects. If you kill all the cells, they're not going to be transformed, right? Logic, very obvious. So the infected cell can't die. And finally, you and also you have to reduce or eliminate virus replication. You can't produce virions, otherwise the virions would eventually go on and kill cells as well. And then the, the cells continue to divide. They become immortal. Now, if you've been listening to our discussion of persistence, you'll recognize the first two conditions. Transformation is a form of persistent infection. Let's go back. To transform a cell, the following events must occur. I think there was a question like this on the exam. To persist, what does a virus have to do? Reduce cytopathic effect, reduce replication. That's the same thing you have to do for transformation. So transformation is really one kind uh, of a persistent infection. All right, so now we've got RNA and DNA viruses transforming cells. It's a rare event. The cells have different properties. What's going on with the viral genome? Well, people started to look at this, Dulbeko and others, uh, and Temin began to look at this, and they found in some cases there are parts of the genome in the cells. Some cases there are no virus genomes in the cell. These are the transformed cells that you put a virus on them, they become transformed. And nobody really understood what this meant. There was no unifying principle. Um, so what kind of infection was this? No one really understood for a long time. So this is the problem we're going to tackle now. How does a virus infection, a DNA or an RNA virus infection, transform cells? In some cases, the genome isn't even there or pieces of it are there. It's rare. What is going on here? So this was an incredible story. It's a 50 to 60 year story starting from Rouse. And here it is summarized. We're going to talk about retroviruses. We're going to talk about DNA viruses. And then, in, as all this is going on, cancer biologists are trying to figure out how cells are transformed and cause cancer. And in the 60s and the 70s, they all came together. And it all make, made sense. This is the beauty of this story. Three different areas of research came together. And the result today is we understand the control of cell growth. Because of studying how viruses perturb it, we understand this whole pathway. We never would have done it. It would have taken a lot longer to do it if we didn't have viruses. So let's start with the retroviruses. Let's find out how does Rouse cause tumors in chickens and uh, transform cells in vitro. So let's go back to uh, 1908. In fact, it, it was earlier than Rouse that these two investigators, Ellerman and Bang, had found that there is a virus that causes leukemia in chickens, and that's avian leukosis virus, ALV. But this was a leukemia, and people didn't realize that it was a cancer, and people were really interested in solid tumors like sarcoma, so they didn't get much attention. ALV, which they found causes a leukemia, is a simple retrovirus, and simple meaning, other than HIV with all those extra genes, this is a simple retrovirus with a relatively simple capsid and not too many genes. Most chickens in the world that you eat or use for egg laying are infected with this virus within a few months of hatching. And uh, in birds over 14 weeks old, uh, leukemia, which we also call leukosis, occurs sporadically in these infected birds. Now, when you eat a chicken, that chicken is harvested before 14 weeks, so probably doesn't have much, if, of, if any, of this virus in it. The incidence of leukemia after 14 weeks is 3%. So most of the birds have a transient viremia. They become immune to the virus, and they don't have any uh, disease. Leukemia, when it does develop, is very slow. So it's not an acute disease. It's not something that comes and goes within a week or so. And of course, it's not a solid tumor. Leukemia is a, is a tumor of blood cells, OK? So this is avian leukosis virus. 
It's present in most chicken flocks. If you Google it, you will find diagnostic kits. So if you raise chickens, you can make sure they don't have ALV in them. It's everywhere today. And it causes a leukemia in older birds. Now, uh, as the birds get older, which birds don't tend to do unless they lay eggs, otherwise you, you, you kill them uh, at a very young age. But do, when they do get older, they start to develop other tumors, connective tissues, tissue tumors or sarcomas, solid tumors. And you can isolate virus from these tumors. That's what Rouse did. That was one of Rouse's solid tumors. So that was a bird that had had leukemia uh, early on and then developed a solid tumor. Uh, the virus that you get from these can cause sarcomas when you put it into chickens. They don't cause leukemia, those viruses. And th they do it very quickly. Remember, the, the leukemia is a slow developing disease. If you isolate virus from these animals with solid tumors, that is birds that have lived uh, later, solid tumors, they cause tumors in new recipients very quickly. And this is one of the viruses that Rouse identified. He took a solid tumor from a chicken. It's actually a chicken from somewhere around here, New Jersey or Long Island, I don't remember. Uh, the farmer brought it to him. He said, my chicken has a tumor, and so Rouse got the virus out of that. This virus grew very well. He was able to grow it in chickens and pass it to subsequent chickens and show that the tumor was passed. Now, Rouse himself and many other investigators repeated this experiment with all sorts of tumors from various chicken strains. And most of the, and they all isolated viruses afterwards, but most of them were defective. They can only replicate if you have the original virus present. So you, they needed a helper virus. These, this will become clear in a moment. So Rouse was actually very lucky because his virus was not defective and he was able to grow it. Can you imagine if he had made an extract of his tumor and then he, he put it in cells and tried to grow it? It wouldn't grow because there's no helper virus present. So what is our Rouse and what's the relationship to avian leukosis virus? Remember, ALV is the virus in all chickens. It causes leukemia in 3% of them. The 97% that live on, eventually some of those develop solid tumors and from them you get Rouse sarcoma virus. So what's the relationship uh, of the two viruses? The key finding was that the viral genomes from solid tumors are recombinants. Rouse sarcoma virus is a recombinant where a piece of cellular DNA is incorporated into the viral genome. And this piece of DNA, in, in the Rouse genome in particular, is not any random piece of DNA, but is a very specific gene. And this was called an oncogene, because that gene, that cellular gene, incorporated into the virus, gave that virus the ability to cause tumors. So it's called an oncogene. And this story, this was all figured out by these two guys, Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus, and they got the Nobel Prize in 1989. So they figured out that Rouse sarcoma virus had picked up a specific cellular gene. Um, they called it the SARC gene because it called, caused the sarcoma, SRC. And they showed that this is a cellular gene that is giving the virus this property. So that was Nobel Prize uh, number two in 1989. And before that, of course, Temin had won his Nobel Prize for discovering reverse transcriptase uh, in Rouse. So uh, I, I think that was on a previous slide. But, you know, when Temin infected these cells in culture with Rouse and got transformed foci, he could then pick those foci up and grow them forever. They were immortal. And he said, how can an RNA virus do this? And, you know, RNA doesn't stay with the cell, so he said there's got to be an enzyme in this virus that makes a DNA copy. And that was the logic that led him to look for reverse transcriptase in virions. It's just brilliant. You know, he went from one observation to the next, and he got reverse transcriptase, and he said, aha, this is how it works. The DNA is made. It's a provirus. It gets integrated into the cell. Okay, so the insight here is that the birds get a variety of rare solid tumors as they age, and, they, and these tumors all have retroviruses that are derived from ALV, the first virus that's in all of the chickens. Most of them are defective. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. Rouse's was not defective. He was really lucky. It would have taken him a long time to figure this out if he had had a defective virus that needed a helper. Now, as, soon, as everyone isolated new viruses from their chickens with their solid tumors, they were all different. They had all picked up different genes. So Rouse sarcoma virus had a cellular gene called VSARC. But all the other ones had new genes. It was a gold mine for molecular oncology because each one was a different oncogene picked out of the cell. 
And then eventually all that was brought together and made sense in terms of the mitogenic pathway of, of the cell. So we're going to explore that. So here are the proviral sequences of these viruses that we've been talking about on the left. Here is avian leukosis virus, the two LTRs, gag, pull, envelope genes. All right. So this is the virus that's in every chicken in the world. And it causes leukemia in 3% of them, and then the rest survive. And if they age, then they, some of them develop solid tumors, and then you can isolate all of these viruses from them. And here's Rouse's sarcoma virus up there on top. You can see it is not defective. It's got two LTRs. Well, these all have two LTRs, otherwise they couldn't replicate. It has the gag, the pall, the envelope gene, and then it's got an extra gene stuck in, the SARC gene, which is from the host cell. The virus has picked up this gene from the host cell, and the presence of that SARC gene makes the cell transformed. And we'll get into how that works in a moment. But I want to show you all these other uh, uh, tumor-causing retroviruses that other people picked out of other tumors from different chickens. And they have all different names. Uh, and you can see they're all defective. None of these can replicate because they're missing most of the viral genes. Look, this one has a piece of gag, and it doesn't have any pall or envelope. So this uh, genome will only replicate in cells infected with ALS, because ALS has to supply the gag, the pall, in the envelope. Same with all these other viruses. They're defective to different stages, but they each have different genes. You can see FIPS, MIB, ETS, MIC, uh, YES, JUN, etc. And these are all name, these are names of cellular genes. We all have these genes in us. They're picked up by a retrovirus and they end up transforming cells. Now this doesn't happen just in birds. Here are mammalian transducing retroviruses. Many people started studying a retrovirus of mouse called murine leukemia virus. And this is also a simple retrovirus. Uh, and when you infect mice, it will cause tumors in a certain number of them. And if you isolate virus from those tumors, again, they are defective. You can see Abelson, Maloney, RAF, FES, FIMS, and each of them has a different oncogene picked up from the mouse genome. So the same thing is with uh, the avian transducing retrovirus. So this is what I mean that they're defective. Rouse was really lucky. Look, among all the people who have isolated uh, these viruses that cause so solid tumors, Rouse had the one that was not defective. Okay, we're okay with that so far? This, this is a lecture where you have to get it at each step, otherwise you're going to get lost. Of course, you can always go back and listen again, of course. All right, so here's a little explanation of a defective versus non-defective. So here's a non-defective retrovirus, avian leukosis virus. The defective viruses are missing viral genes. Rouse's, again, was not defective. It could replicate on its own. But this one, PRC2 avian sarcoma virus, would require uh, the avian leukosis virus uh, to replicate. So why are they defective? Well, in the process of picking up the oncogene from the cell, again, FIPS, SARC, MIB, whatever it is, sometimes sequence is lost. Most of the time, sequence is lost. And if you're lucky, you don't lose anything, which is what happened for Rouse. So here are two theories on how this happens, all right? Just so that you can put together what you know about retroviruses and figure out how it would pick up a cellular gene. Now you know that retroviral DNA integrates into the host cell. That's the provirus right there. So we, we talked about that quite a bit. Two LTRs, the virus makes, uh, the mRNA of the virus is made by cellular DNA, polymer, uh, DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So the idea is that sometimes the RNA doesn't terminate here in the right-hand LTR, but it keeps going. And it reads through, and maybe the virus has just randomly integrated next to an oncogene. So here we have an oncogene shown here. Now we have a transcript that um, includes the oncogene. So it's a rare event, but there's powerful selection for it because the virus is going to end up transforming cells, which will outgrow everything in the culture or in the animal. So here you have packaging of this um, RNA along with, say, a wild-type RNA and a virus particle. Uh, and eventually, a reverse transcription will produce a, uh, a genome that has two LTRs. So normally, this, this guy here wouldn't have the, the LTR at the right-hand end. But if, it's, if it undergoes reverse transcription and the enzyme jumps, say, from a wild-type template to this one, you can see it's got the right LTR, it's got the, the oncogene, and it goes back to the wild type RNA. You will eventually make a DNA with two LTRs, and then your oncogene is right here in the middle. 
Okay, so that's your transforming virus. It's picked it up from a cell. This is just another way that this happens. It's not, not important. The point is that the virus is, is doing aberrant things to pick these up. And this is totally unnecessary for the virus in order to replicate. So now these um, transforming viruses often undergo additional mutations that activate these oncogenes in various ways. And then you have your transforming virus. So that's how uh, what we call oncogene capture occurs. So once again, these genes are in all of us. They are genes involved in normal regulation of growth. The retrovirus picks them up by accident. They are aberrantly expressed or mutated, and they cause transformation of the cell. So the virus doesn't need this oncogene in order to replicate. Now, when we talk about DNA tumor viruses, you will see that the, the way they transform cells, it's still an accident but it's directly a property of viral proteins whose job it is to kickstart the DNA replication machinery of the cell. So I just want to give you a little preview of that because it's a bit different from retroviruses. So these oncogenes that are picked up, and this is, we've talked about one mechanism. We're going to talk about two others in a moment. These are not precise copies. Sometimes they're mutant. But if they are a precise copy, they're overexpressed. Okay, so some of these oncogenes, and we'll talk about what they are in a moment, uh, they, they're normally very tightly regulated in the cell, and sometimes when the retrovirus picks them up, mutations accumulate them that make them constitutively active, or they're overexpressed by the retrovirus, and that transforms the cell. So these normal cellular genes are called proto-oncogenes. In retrospect, it's really a misnomer, all right? They are, their job in the cell, in us, is not to be an oncogene. Their job is to control the growth cycle, but they were given this name because they were found before they we really understood what they were doing in the normal cell, so the name has stuck. So in the cells, uh, these are called proto-oncogenes. They control the cell cycle when cells will, will divide. Uh, and if they're expressed at the wrong time or if they're mutated, the cell grows without regulation, out of control, transformation. Remember, the transformed cells that pile up on top of one another, one way to get that is by expressing these oncogenes when they should not normally be expressed. These are found in all cells, these proto-oncogenes. Each of you have them, I have them, you will pass them on to your children. You need them. If you take them away, you have problems. They're highly regulated, and there are over 60 of them now known. Most of them picked up in various transforming uh, retroviruses. And here's the nomenclature, the cellular genes that have a normal role in us. They're called, they have a little C in front for cellular, and then uh, onks, for example, SARC, MYC, MOS, RAS, whatever the name of the protein happens to be. Uh, and then when, you, when these are picked up, when these cellular genes are picked up by retroviruses, by transforming retroviruses, uh, isolated from tumors, they have altered copies or overexpressed copies. We call them V-onks, V-SARC, uh, V-MYC, V-MOS, V-RAS. Okay, so the genes, they may be identical, in that case, the retrovirus is simply overexpressing them, or sometimes they're mutated. So the V designation indicates that, that this is different from the C version of the gene in the cell. So th these were studied for many years, as you can imagine, in people isolated oncogenes from various experimental models, chickens and, uh, and, and mice and, and others. And then they were put into classes according to their function. And here there are five classes of proto-oncogenes. And this will start to maybe make it clear how the, uh, the retroviral expression of these leads to transformation. So first of all, some oncogenes are extracellular growth factors. So for our cells to divide, we need cues. A cell sitting in a culture disc needs a cue to divide. One of the cues is a growth factor, which is present in serum. That's why we add serum to cells in culture. These bind receptors and tell the cell to divide. All right. So you have extracellular growth factors. The genes encoding these are oncogenes. They're picked up by retrovirus. We have the receptors for these growth virus, uh, factors. So the, the receptors on the plasma membrane that capture, that bind to the growth factor, they can also be oncogenes as well. Then when a re growth factor binds a receptor, it sends a signal to the nucleus, a series of phosphorylation events, a signal transduction pathway. The members of that pathway are also oncogenes. And then, of course, that pathway makes its way to the nucleus, 
probably transcription proteins go in the nucleus and start to make genes that are involved in, in replication of the cell. Nuclear transcription factors. All these four are picked up by retroviruses. And overexpression or mutation of any of them inappropriately causes cells to just divide forever and give them this transformed phenotype. Now there's a fifth class of proto-oncogene discovered uh, by the DNA tumor viruses, and these are called tumor suppressor genes. These are negative regulators of cell growth. They are not picked up by retroviruses. They're not picked up by DNA tumor viruses, but they are interfered with uh, by DNA tumor viruses, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. All right, so these are the five classes that have been discovered uh, by studying um, these transforming viruses. So here's how they work in cells. So this whole pathway, this is the pathway by which a growth factor binds to a cell surface receptor and the cell starts dividing, okay? There, there are growth factor receptors in our circulation. When they are produced under whatever conditions, after you eat, uh, if, you, if you are exercising and you need to produce something, growth factors are produced, they bind to cells and they make the cells divide. Uh, and so they're the growth factors, they bind to receptors so here, cis is the name of one of these viral oncogenes that was picked up. It's a growth factor. ERB, B, FIMS, KIT, RAS, SCA, these are all growth factor receptors in the plasma membrane. So the retrovirus is picking up these genes and making them expressed inappropriately. Membrane-bound protein kinases. These are the beginning of the signal transduction pathway from the receptor into the nucleus. Here's SARC. That's the gene picked up by Rouse's virus. It's a membrane-bound protein kinase. Then you have G proteins that uh, transfer uh, GTP down the transduction path. Those are also oncogenes of RAS. Cytoplasmic protein kinase is part of the signal transduction pathway. And then finally, proteins in the nucleus, or bay, ETS, FOS, June, et cetera. These are nuclear oncogenes. These are transcription factors that are activated in response to the growth factor binding on the plasma membrane, and also cell cycle regulators and th those will come into play in a moment. So do you, do you see this? By interfering with this pathway, these retroviruses make cells divide. They pick up any one of these, uh, the genes encoding these proteins, which are part of this uh, growth control pathway. They overexpress them or mutate them so that they're constitutively active, and the cell starts dividing and it doesn't stop. It's no longer regulated. And that's why this, we got this original phenotype in cultured cells when we put Rouse sarcoma virus onto it. We delivered to those cells this SARC protein. We expressed it all the time. The virus is making this all the time. And it shouldn't be. SARC should only be expressed when cells are getting a signal from growth factors. But if you express SARC, it starts this signal transduction pathway and the cell divides forever. So uncontrolled growth, cell shape change, uh, loss of adhesion properties are all related to overexpressing uh, these proteins. So in general, these oncogenes are under strict control. I've told you that already. They can be activa activated in a couple of ways. Uh, you can have no mutations in the normal genes. So sometimes the retrovirus picks up a cellular oncogene and mutations occur in it. You know, the retroviral life cycle is error prone. So you can have mutations which will activate it. Uh, loss of control of expression. The protein isn't changed, but regulation is lost. So the the, the retrovirus is making a ton of this protein when it's supposed to be regulated, and that can cause transformation as well. So these are dominant forms of transformation. You put an altered gene in, you just need one copy, and that's enough to transform the cell because the protein has a dominant phenotype. Now, the third class here are in the tumor suppressor genes, which you've only mentioned uh, briefly. These are genes that are not picked up by the retroviruses, but were discovered by studying DNA tumor viruses. These are negative regulators of the cell cycle. They, they are breaks on the cell cycle. And if um, these mutations in these proteins are recessive because of course you have two copies of the genes encoding these breaks. If you only mutate one, you will not have a transformed phenotype. You have to either delete the gene or mutate both copies. So that's why we call them recessive. So these are different from these. These are positive activators of cell growth number one and two. The, the tumor suppressor genes are negative regulators. How they work will be obvious uh, in a moment. And as a consequence, these mutations are recessive. Okay, so now we have to look at the cell cycle because this is where we're gonna talk about the breaks. So here's your cell cycle, which I'm sure every one of you knows. 
uh, and you know there's a point where cells undergo mitosis, uh, and then they go through a series of gap phases. The, an important phase is uh, the synthesis phase, where they make DNA, they replicate their DNA, and then eventually the cell divides in mitosis. All right. Now this does not occur unless conditions are right. The cell doesn't want to divide unless there are nutrients and everything is okay. So what do I mean by everything is okay? No viruses around. Cell doesn't want to divide if it senses a virus infection. So one key stimulator of the cell cycle are the proto-oncogenes that we've just talked about. They give a go signal. If there's a growth factor in the medium, the growth factor will bind to receptors and start that cascade to get the cells dividing. What they're doing is pushing the cells into mitosis. There is an incredible, beautiful molecular mechanism that's been sorted out, which shows, in fact, how this happens. And we, we don't have time to talk about it today, but you'll see a little inkling of it later. So that's what the retroviruses do when they've picked up these proto-oncogenes. They push the cell through this cycle. Retrovirus doesn't need to do this to replicate. It doesn't need it. It's an accident. It's an accident because the retrovirus inserts randomly in the genome, and sometimes it's going to pick up one of these proto-oncogenes. Now, there's another um, key point of this cycle, and that's down here. This is another stop point. Before you start making DNA, there are a number of tumor suppressor genes, checkpoint proteins, that say, all right, do we want to go further here? We got a signal from the cell surface. Is everything okay? Sh or should we start making DNA? And these proteins decide whether to go or not. They can put a break on the cycle, a molecular break, or they can let it go through. And these genes were picked up by studying the DNA tumor viruses, which we just mentioned briefly and which now we will, we will get into. So retroviruses, three ways of transforming cells. Uh, viruses like Rous, you infect a chicken, it will make a tumor in a couple of weeks. It's really quick because it has an activated oncogene. The virus infects cells, make a ton of SARC protein. It's a dominant oncogene. It's part of that signaling pathway in the mitogenic pathway. You get a tumor very quickly. And you have retroviruses with intermediate kinetics of tumor formation. ALV, the leukosis virus, that causes months. We, we didn't really talk much about this, but that's a tumor virus. It picks up an oncogene. It does, I'm sorry, it doesn't pick up an oncogene, but it integrates next to one in the genome. So these ALVs, which are non-defective, they're in every chicken, they integrate next to oncogenes and activate them, and that's how they transform, and that just takes longer. And finally, the longest kinetics of tumor formation viruses like HTLV, they have no dominant oncogene. They don't cause cis activation like uh, the ALVs do. But we think they make regulatory proteins that activate transcription of cellular genes that are then involved in growth control. So that even takes longer. All right, so three classes of transformation. So we have three kinds of transforming retroviruses. We have transducing. They pick up an oncogene from the cell. Rouse sarcoma is a transducing retrovirus. We have cis-acting retroviruses. They integrate next to an oncogene and activate it. And then the transacting retroviruses, which integrate, they make a protein which then activates uh, the, trans the, the transcription of an oncogene at a distance. All right? And those are diagrammed here. Transducing, all these retroviruses integrate into our genome. The transducing viruses pick up a, um, an oncogene when they're transcribed and go on to transform by by expressing that. The cis-activating retroviruses, they don't pick up an oncogene, they integrate next to one. And there's a promoter in this right-hand LTR. I told you a number of times earlier, there's a promoter there. It's going to be important later. Well, here's where it is. It activates the production of an oncogene, which isn't supposed to be activated at that particular time. And consequently, the cells are transformed. And finally, the transacting, uh, transactivating viruses, they don't pick up an oncogene, they don't integrate next to one. They make a protein, which is part of the viral replication cycle. It's a transactivator. It's needed to activate the promoter in the, in the left-hand LTR. And this can activate cellular genes, like cytokines, that make cells divide. And we think that's how they cause uh, tumors. OK. So this is pretty much the, uh, the end of transforming retroviruses. They transform cells as a mistake. Please remember that. They don't need to do this. It's an error because they integrate into the genome and they randomly pick up a gene or activate a gene or, or transactivate a gene. All retroviruses are insertional mutagens. They have to insert in order to replicate, right? The provirus DNA has to be in your genome. But it doesn't have to be next to an oncogene and it doesn't have to pick it up. That confers no advantage 
uh, on the virus. All right, let's talk about the DNA viruses now and what this has told us. First DNA tumor viruses were papillomaviruses that cause warts in rabbits, so a papilloma is a wart. If you have ever heard of a jackalope, have you, anybody heard of a jackalope? This is a mythical creature that's a hybrid between a jackrabbit and an antelope. It's nothing more than rabbits with huge papillomas uh, on them. So here's one here and here. So people have seen these and they go, oh my god, it's a new animal, it's a hybrid, but it's not really, it's just, uh, 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 these are warts. And Richard Shope in 1933 uh, isolated a virus from them, papilloma virus, and the human versions are the viruses that we talk about and infect us today. These, by the way, are fine. They fall off. The rabbit's okay. They just look, uh, they just look unhappy. This guy looks very angry, doesn't he? Uh, DNA, more DNA tumor viruses. Ludwig Gross discovered polyoma viruses in 1953. Uh, we talked about SV40. This is a polyoma virus. They cause tumors under certain conditions. And the key here is that the tumor formation is quite rare. Uh, these, these are, the natural host for these are mice, but they don't cause tumors in mice. They cause tumors in other animals that you use in the laboratory, hamsters, rats, rabbits. So in mice, the viruses are lytic. They don't cause tumors. But in other animals, there's some issue, so they can cause a tumor. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, other DNA tumor viruses, SV40, which we have talked about a lot, this turned out to be a big model for studying DNA replication, it was discovered as a contaminant of polio vaccines in 1952. The polio vaccines are to this day grown in monkey kidney cells. And in, that, in these days, they used to go out and capture monkeys and take out their kidneys and make cell cultures, and they had SV40 in them. And a lot of Americans got SV40, and uh, it didn't seem to do anything, but there are people who feel that it caused tumors, but I don't think they're correct. The natural host of this virus is the monkey. It doesn't cause tumors in the monkey. It's a lytic virus, but if you infect other kinds of uh, cells in culture, it will transform them, and in certain animals, it will cause um, tumors as well. So this is an important uh, way to look at it. We have SV40 and mouse polyomaviruses, and depending on the species, you have different outcomes. So SV40 in the monkey, that's the natural host. It's a permissive infection. Virus replicates really well, quickly, kills the cells, end of story. Uh, in mice, uh, uh, mouse polyomavirus, it's not permissive in monkey cells. So nothing happens at all. In the mouse, SV40 is non-permissive, it's the wrong host, but mouse polyomavirus, of course, is permissive because that's the right host. And then we have four combinations of semi-permissivity here, and these are the key ones. If you put SV40 into hamsters or rats, or if you put mouse polyoma into hamsters or rats, you get a semi-permissive condition. You get a little bit of replication, and this is where you get transformation in tumors. And this is the key here that we'll come back to. So semi-permissive, only the early proteins are main, you get no virions, and tumors only occur in these species. So if you put SV40 into hamsters or rats, or if you put mouse polyoma into hamsters or rats, that's the only time when you get uh, tumors. Okay, so this is important to remember. No, only early proteins are made, no virions. That's semi-permissive. So how does this work in the lab? You take a dish of cells from the wrong species, you infect it with SV40, if you infect 100,000 cells, you may get one transformed focus. That is one focus of cells that starts to grow out uncontrollably. So it's not normal part of the replication cycle. Okay? It doesn't happen in the normal host. Why is it rare? And what does this have to do for tumors? These are questions that we will answer. But before we do, we're going to add one more virus to this mix. And that's adenovirus, these DNA viruses with pretty big double-stranded genomes. These viruses don't cause tumors in people. But some of them cause tumors in hamsters, and some of them cause and other serotypes as well. Just like the papilloma and polyoma tu uh, tumors, these are rare events, and they happen in the wrong species. So the human ads do not cause tumors in people. And uh, it's very inefficient. A focus requires infection by a lot of virus. So common theme, you infect the wrong host with a lot of virus, you get a rare transformation event. So what's going on here? key discovery was people started looking in cells, in transformed cells infected by these DNA viruses, and they found a viral protein. So they called it T for tumor antigen. You remember T antigens from SV40? This is the viral protein that's needed to bind the origin of replication of the virus to kick it into DNA synthesis. So when an animal has a tumor infected with, say, SV40, it makes antibodies to the T antigen. These are viral proteins 
the rare transformed cells make these T antigens. T antigens for SV40, polyoma, adenovirus, they all make T antigens. They're not related, but they're T antigens. It's the only protein you can reliably find in virus transformed cells. Most of the viral DNA is missing from these cells, but all that remains is DNA encoding the T antigen. Of course, you need the viral DNA to be present. So this is really different from retroviral transformation, right? You've got most of the genome gone, and then you've just got a DNA fragment left that is encoding this T antigen. So what's going on? Uh, these T antigens are large and small T for SV40, large, middle, and small T for polyoma. Again, these are essential viral proteins, but they're the ones that are found in transformed cells and in tumors. Uh, there's no homology here. Uh, in the papilloma viruses, there are T antigens encoded by E5, E6, and E7 genes, and the adenovirus T antigens are called E1A and E1B. And again, they have no homology amongst each other. But somehow, they are important for transformation and tumor formation because they're the ones you find in the transformed cells. So how do these work? T antigens are normal viral proteins that the virus requires. Remember, T antigen is needed to bind to the um, origin of replication of SV40 to melt it out so the polymerase can eventually get in. This is an essential viral protein. Um, it's required for viral DNA synthesis. And I've already told you it's the only gene that's retained in transformed cells. But look at this. T antigen alone can transform cultured cells. So once people found that you know, SV40 T antigen is in all tumors caused by the virus, they then said, what happens if we just express T antigen alone? And lo and behold, it will transform cells and put them on the way to becoming uh, a tumor. So this is a normal viral protein. The virus needs this. Why does it cause a tumor now and then? So let's develop this story. This is why SV40 needs T antigen. Remember, it doesn't encode its own DNA polymerase. It needs to use the host DNA replication machinery. And TNA is important for helping to recruit the host DNA polymerase to the origin. That's great. But remember, remember all these DNA viruses have to kick the cell into mitosis so that the cellular DNA synthetic machinery is active. The viruses need to do this. It's an essential part of their life cycle. T antigen is one of the viral proteins that, done, that does this. So it's SV40T and all the T antigens of all the other DNA transforming viruses, their function is to kick the cell into dividing. So maybe now you can start to see how aberrant production of T could lead uh, to transformation, but we'll certainly get to that. All right, so there was one, uh, several more bits of information that were needed to connect all of this together, okay? Uh, T antigen and transformation in the cell cycle. And a key observation was that when you infect cells with SV40 and they make T antigen, that protein binds a cellular protein called P53. Hugely important protein in the cell. This is one of the proteins that is a tumor suppressor gene that operates at that lower part of the cell cycle. So that's T antigen of SV40. The adenovirus T antigens um, are, in act, they interact with uh, a, a series of genes called the E2F factors. So, Early gene expression requires these E2F proteins. These are transcription factors that the virus requires. E2Fs are bound to another checkpoint protein called the RB protein. So these were early disparate observations. SV40T binds P53. E2F, which is required for adenovirus early gene expression, binds RB. These were all subsequently found to be critical players in the cell cycle control without SV40 or adenovirus being around. And that's because they operate down here at the restriction point. So again, here is your cell cycle. We've expanded mitosis, so you can see uh, the cells actually dividing there. But again, you have a mitotic stage, you have a resting point, there's a restriction point down here. And then the decision is made whether to proceed into the synthesis of DNA so that you can divide again. So cells are stimulated to divide up here, and then they have to pass this restriction point uh, down at the bottom. And that restriction point is controlled by these two proteins, P53 and RB. These guys are the tumor suppressor genes that operate down here. These are breaks. These two proteins stop cells from going into making DNA if the conditions are not right. 
So they're really the opposite of the oncogenes that retroviruses pick up. The oncogenes push the cells into division. The tumor suppressors hold them down here, making sure that everything is okay. So the default is for P53 and RB to hold this cell cycle at this checkpoint. And if everything's okay, then they will let it go on. And remember, P53 and RB are somehow interacting with SV40 and adenovirus protein. So that's really now the key to understanding uh, what's going here, on here. So again, this, this is what I've told you. A go, no-go decision to turn on the cell cycle is determined by factors in the media. And that's what P53 and RB are looking at. I got this signal from uh, the growth, the mitogenic pathway here, but is it really sure that everything is okay? Uh, is the outside world rich enough to replicate the cell? And remember, these are the proteins discovered in transforming retroviruses, and now the DNA tumor viruses are pointing down here. So if conditions are not right, these tumor suppressor genes stop the cells at this cycle before going into DNA synthesis. So even though they, they may have had a signal, if things are not right, and we'll talk about what right is in a moment, uh, the cell cycle stops here. Now one of these two proteins is the retinoblastoma protein. This was discovered as a gene mutated in kids with retinal tumors. These are tumors of very young kids. They have to be homozygous because these are, these are uh, recessive mutations. And mutations in that gene causes uncontrolled cell division leading to a tumor. So these kids who have mutations in that protein paved the way to understanding this. The RB protein in the cell uh, binds this transcription factor E2F family of proteins. Now E2F, remember, are the transcription factors that are somehow involved with adenovirus gene expression. We'll get to back to that in a moment. The E2F, the proteins that are controlled by E2F transcription factors are the proteins the cell needs to go through mitosis uh, and DNA synthesis. So if uh, normally RB is bound to these E2F proteins and they cannot uh, act as transcription factors and therefore the proteins needed to put the cell through the cycle are not made. So that's how RB breaks the cell cycle. It binds up these transcription factors that are essential for progression past uh, that checkpoint in the previous slide right here. So before going into DNA synthesis, if, if RB senses that things aren't right, it will stop the cell cycle. When RB is phosphorylated, then E2F is released. E2F can go on and turn on all the genes that are needed to get through the rest of the cell cycle. Okay, so now what, what phosphorylates RB? Well, it's a cascade coming down from the plasma membrane. If you have a growth factor bound to a receptor, you start a signaling pathway, and that eventually ends up phosphorylating RB. It separates from E2F. All the proteins are made that you need to go through the cell cycle in the cell divides. It's really brilliant. And you may know that these proteins in this pathway, these are all oncogenes picked up by retroviruses. So here we have the interaction with that growth factor pathway uh, and the RB checkpoint protein down here. Okay, so that's how RB works. Now viruses, how do they interact with that? I told you already, T antigen kicks quiet cells into S phase because they want the cell to be dividing, to be making DNA polymerase so the virus can use that DNA polymerase to replicate its genome. The virus makes T antigen, SV40. T antigen binds RB. Remember, RB is bound to E2F proteins. Those E2F proteins are transcription factors that are needed for progression through the cell cycle. When T antigen binds RB, the E2F proteins are released and the cell can divide. This is how T antigen kicks the cell into dividing. So when SV40 lytically infects a permissive cell, T antigen interacts with RB and gets the cell cycle going because the virus wants that. So a long time ago, that's what we told you, that T antigen kickstarts the cell cycle. This is how it works, by binding to RB. So here it is. T, uh, large T antigen of SV40 uh, is binding to RB, to, uh, to RB right up here. RB is normally bound to E2F. So binding of large T to RB frees up the E2F proteins, which are the, uh, the flesh-colored guys right here. Those are transcription factors that can then go on to make the proteins you need for DNA synthesis and mitosis. And it's not only large T that does this, but the adenovirus E1A, the papillomavirus E7, they all bind 
RB and pull it away from the E2Fs. And this is how adenovirus gets the E2F proteins that it needs to transcribe its genome. These are transcription factors that the virus needs. So you see in both cases the virus is not trying to transform the cell. It's trying to get it to divide so that it has a DNA replication machinery that it can use. The transformation is an accident, really. There's one more checkpoint we have to talk about, P53. So we've talked about RB and how the viral T antigens overcome the RB checkpoint, okay? P53 is also important. What it's looking for, so RB is down there uh, looking to make sure that there are growth factors bound at the cell surface. P53 is monitoring aberrant DNA. So either DNA damage or unscheduled DNA synthesis. That means viral DNA synthesis. P53 can sense this. We, can't, we don't have time to talk about that. But if P53 finds that there is damaged DNA in the cell or viral DNA, puts a break on the cell cycle. We don't want to multiply when there's this bad DNA around. So the virus needs to get around this as well. So as, as I said, P53 recognizes DNA damage. It recognizes viral uh, DNA intermediates as abnormal. If RB has been bound by T antigens, E2F is released, P53 will sense this. It will bind E2F and it will induce apoptosis in cells. It says, there's something wrong here, we're gonna kill this cell and stop it right here. So the cells divide and that's a great way to prevent virus infection. And this is one of the intrinsic defenses against DNA virus infection, that P53 senses that there's an infection going on and it puts a break uh, on the cell cycle and it induces apoptosis. But obviously uh, viruses have to get around that. The T antigens counter the RB. The T antigens also inactivate P53. The SV40T, the adenovirus E1A and E1B, the papillomavirus E5, E6, and E7, they all do something to P53 so that it's not functional. They either degrade it or sequester it or do a variety of other things, amazing different mechanisms. So we've gotten rid of RB, and we, now we get rid of P53. So the virus kicks the cell through the cell cycle. There are no more uh, obstacles for it to do this. All right, so we're almost done here. So let's figure out two more things. Why were all the viral genes except T antigen deleted or turned off in all these virus-transformed cells, and why is transformation so inefficient? So remember, two low probability events are required for transformation. You can't express the lethal late genes. The late genes are what makes virions and that will eventually kill the cell. And if your cell is gonna be transformed, you cannot do that. Uh, the way you can do that is to delete late genes or you infect a semi-permissive cell where you don't get late gene expression. That's why you get tumors of a monkey virus in hamster cells because you don't get late gene expression. And then at a certain frequency, you can get uh, expression of only the T antigen and transformation. You also need to constitutively express T antigen. This is absolutely required for transformation. If you have a transformed cell that expresses T antigen and you shut off T, the cell will revert to a non-transformed phenotype. You absolutely need that. So that's why the viral DNA encoding T antigen has to be integrated so it can make T antigen. So this is a rare event. This depends on the T antigen DNA uh, breaking away from the rest of the genome and integrating uh, into the cell. So a non-permissive cell where you're not getting late protein-mediated lysis and stable expression of the T antigen. And remember, the T antigen interferes with P53 and RB to keep uh, the cell going through the cycle. So I want you to understand that this is also a mistake. Normally, these viruses in permissive cells, they are making T antigens to expressly push the cell through a cell cycle so that the DNA replication machinery is activated and then they can use the DNA polymerase for their own genomes. They do not want to transform cells. And remember, in a permissive cell, the cell is gonna die. So it's never gonna be transformed. But under the wrong conditions, when you infect the wrong host or it's a non-permissive infection, you get random rare transformants because you have integration of the T antigen DNA into the cell that gets expressed and that makes the cell divide and divide forever. And that's another recipe for transformation. Not needed for normal replication. So both for retroviruses and these DNA tumor viruses, uh, you don't need uh, to transform cells. So we say transformation is an epiphenomenon of a unique lifestyle. The tumor viruses have to interfere with the cell cycle, as we have said. 
they have to start the cell synthetic machinery and that's done as we've said by T antigens interfering with the normal function of P53 and RB. So you, you get the cells going, you block apoptosis, the cells divide, they divide, they keep dividing, they are transformed cells. They're on their way to being, being cancer cells. Now remember, they're not cancer cells yet. They have to accumulate more mutations in order to become a cancer cell. And the virus has nothing to do with that anymore. These cells are now dividing very quickly and incessantly, and the virus, as I said, it's not a goal of the virus to do that, so this is really an accident. So this all started with a chicken with a solid tumor in 1909. And all of this understanding of growth control, the mitogenic pathway, the checkpoint proteins in the cell cycle, this all came from studying DNA tumor viruses. These tumor viruses don't cause tumors in people. Today, someone might say, why should we study a chicken tumor? It doesn't cause human disease. But now we understand all of this growth control because uh, we've studied these. So I think this is just a terrific story. I hope you liked it. <laughs>